Okay, I think I might start because we're a couple of minutes past uh, 10 o'clock now. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us today for uh, the DMRC's Digital Inclusion and Participation Keyword Series Forum 2, where our keyword is empowerment. And uh, the reason we um, started up this series was because we wanted to have a way to bring people together um, from across not just the academic um, community, but also from industry groups. And so um, typically with these keywords, we, we plan to have uh, one um, academic speaker, someone who's you know, a more established academic, um, a HDR student, because we think it's really important that um, HDR students get an opportunity to present their work. And often they're also doing uh, the most cutting edge stuff in the field. Um, and then also um, someone from industry. So uh, someone who's um, either a partner of ours on a project or someone who we've heard about or met who we know is doing really interesting things. Um, and the idea with the keyword is just to give us an opportunity to um, think about particular concepts or ideas that relate to the idea of digital inclusion and participation. And, all, and the idea with the keyword is to kind of be generative and to um, help to develop a, um, a conversation. Um, but before we get into any of that, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and um, QUT acknowledges the Turrbal and Yuggera as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands. We pay our respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits and we recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. And of course, QUT acknowledges the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QUT community. And um, of course, um, we're also um, joining this call from other parts of Australia and um, other parts of Queensland potentially today. So um, we'd um, invite you to just think about um, where you are and um, the traditional owners of the um, place where you are today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Amber Marshall now, who's going to um, talk about our keyword, keyword, just to give some sense of what the, um, how we're thinking about the topic, and then she's going to introduce our three speakers for today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, so welcome everybody, and um, thanks once again um, to everybody for joining us today. So for this forum too, uh, we decided to focus on the word em empowerment um, because, you know, it's really central to a lot of the work that um, we do in the digital inclusion and participation program and to the work that industry does uh, out in the world. But we also think it's a bit of a, a contentious term in that um, while you know it's a, a generally a, a positive term in terms of transferal of resources and power to individuals who may feel disempowered there's also some contention around um, sometimes um, people who are said to be empowered feeling indignation or, or resentment um, rather than empowerment so we just thought we'd throw that, um, I guess, contention into the mix today. Uh, and we've asked our three uh, speakers to, to speak um, about their work in relation um, to, to this word and this theme. So I'll briefly introduce our three speakers for today and their full bios are in the information uh, sheet that you would have um, got with this invitation if you'd like to know a bit more about them. Here we go. So first up we have Bridget Harris and she is a researcher in the DMRC and also in the, the School of Justice. She's a, a DECRA fellow and her work is revolving around um, researching technology facilitated domestic and partner violence uh, advocacy and justice. So she'll talk to us about her work in that space and she was just imparting to us earlier that she's in the field at the moment um, doing some some kind of real world interventions and observing those so that will be really really interesting secondly we've got Cecily Michaels uh, from LEAP uh, we've been doing work alongside LEAP in the DMRC here for a few years now the LEAP is a partner on our recent ARC linkage which is just getting up and running on uh, low-income families 
Uh, and Cecily is the CEO of LEAP and she'll be talking about digital mentoring um, interventions and um, practices uh, on the ground in, across Australia. And then finally, we have Christelle Antonitis. She's a PhD student at the very pointy end of her doctorate. Uh, in the DMRC and her work focuses on the gender digital divide in South Africa. So we're really going to get an international perspective as well. So I'll leave it at that. The format for today will be that uh, each of our speakers will talk for about 15 minutes. They're going to share their own screens and share some slides. Uh, if you think of questions as we're going through, just pop them in the chat but we will save them all until the end. And we've, we've um, put aside 30 minutes uh, for that Q&A at the end. So without further ado, uh, I'll invite Bridget to share her screen and her research. Sorry, it is coming, technical issues, of course. Here we go. Okay. And one last adjustment. Oh, sorry, almost there. Just trying to get my Zoom a bit smaller. Oh, sorry. I've just got some notes next to me because I am just, I'm just going to keep it because it's just being a little bit difficult. I'm just going to keep it on. I know it's not the ideal view, but just like this. Um, so thank you so much for having me here today to talk alongside uh, Chris Dillon and Cecily and for opening up this discussion about empowerment and, and hopefully I think debate too. Um, so what I'm going to do briefly is talk about the uh, work that I'm doing, how empowerment and inclusion is coming up there. I'm also going to talk about some uh, critiques of empowerment and then I'm going to close with thinking about some of the ethos and methodologies and um, outputs that we might think about with empowerment. So my work essentially focuses on uh, domestic violence and technology and how technology is used uh, to entrap victim survivors. It's involved working with diverse cohorts and some different barriers and vulnerabilities that have emerged. I've worked predominantly with victim survivors who identify as female. I'm gonna mostly talk about this work in relation to women residing in rural, regional and remote places. So technology is just another tool that perpetrators use. It's part of the coercive and controlling tactics they engage in. Uh, there are some forms of digital harm that are really readily problematized or criminalized. And so you might think about things like stalking or image-based sexual abuse, for instance. But we do also have these kind of everyday behaviors, these everyday intrusions. And if you're familiar with um, Rosie's fabulous work, you will be familiar with this idea about the behaviors aren't, that aren't necessarily really recognized and responded to because of the daily level that they occur on and also the individualized element. Uh, so just to give you an example, uh, we might think about how great FaceTime has been in the context of COVID to connect with other people, to, um, when we, especially when we are, have been remote. But what we've seen happen is FaceTime used to um, gain insight into where a victim cyber has moved. We've had perpetrators encouraging kids to turn on FaceTime and, you know, oh, show me around, show me around your house. And it's very much about also getting information about those entry and exit points. Uh, we also might think about the different ways that, say, location-based technologies might be used. And you might, for instance, um, use location sharing with your partner and that's something that you're both really comfortable with and it's something that you find really useful maybe but of course there are some dangerous undertones if we're talking about location uh, based activations with someone who's exited a violent relationship so it's not the technology itself that is the issue but the context that it is used in uh, the intent and the effect that comes up so Abusers seek to disempower victim survivors. 
And this is really causing this notion of uh, entrapment. And I've got a quote down here, which is talking about this kind of hostage style element, the harms that it inflicts on dignity, liberty and autonomy. Digital coercive control, which is what I refer to it as, is spaceless. And that's because you can be exposed anytime you're using a device or digital media account. Um, but we do need to think about place. And that is because people in rural, regional, remote locations encounter further barriers when they are seeking assistance, when they're responding to violence. They also encounter greater levels of uh, fatal violence. That's something I'm gonna come back to later on than people in urban communities. In trying to extend control over victim survivors, isolation is, is a really big tactic that, that abusers will use. And this has particular implications when you are socially isolated in rural, regional, remote places, uh, particularly people who are um, on temporary visas or might have immigrated to a new country. They don't have those, those real world bonds necessarily. It's also really significant if we think about geographic isolation and just being further away from your friends and family. So technology can offer those really key ways to maintain that social contact and support. It also is important for us to think about because in smaller communities, there are less services around, there, are, there is less access to help seeking. So technology can be really key here, especially when we do have abusers who are well known, who are well liked, it can be really intimidating to help seek. So technology might provide that other, other channel and also access to things like culturally safe services. Um, education and employment opportunities are really important too. They can be facilitated by tech, less available in our non-urban areas. But of course, we know that the digital divide is a huge impediment and that is um, something abusers are only too aware of. They will know where, for instance, dropout zones are when you are leaving um, a court or a police station and it's something that they do often reference. Victim survivors are often told to disengage from technology. That's not only unfair, but really unreasonable if you think about the role that technology plays in your life. Uh, it can also be really dangerous. So if someone is engaging in coercive control, in obsessive behaviours, in stalking, they're all things that we recognise as homicide flags. And it's unlikely that somebody will just then stop if that tech channel is cut off. What we often see happens is uh, looking for other avenues to exert control to surveil someone, such as through in-person stalking. And when contract is suddenly cut, we also often see an increase in physical violence, even where it hasn't previously existed in the relationship. In rural areas being further distance can mean that what would become an assault in a metropolitan area can quite easily become a homicide in just because of that sheer distance to medical assistance. Uh, victim survivors become experts in knowing their own risk and they might want to leave some tech channels open to manage it uh, and to also gain insight into what the perpetrator is thinking. And so that means that there can be some sense of control in leaving open, for instance, a phone channel, a social media account, an email address. But of course, they're still exposed to violence. Uh, so for me, I think empowerment is really perhaps something that happens when we're on the opposite end, when we're looking at um, the opposite, I guess, of the kind of harms that I've been talking about. And sometimes that is framed as if somebody is able to safely use technology. But I do have an issue with that kind of framework. And that's because um, we can't overlook the huge amount of labour that we're expecting somebody to do to maintain their own safety, the huge amount of time, energy and resources. And this might be in trying to change accounts, trying to modify online behaviours, buying new devices, becoming tech savvy, learning about different safety features, keeping up with all the different safety features. When things change with apps, there can be huge risk that happens. So it means trying to stay on top of all of these things constantly. And it's not only their own technology that they are managing and anxious about, but the tech that is used by children, by friends, by family members. There's also a huge amount of uh, victim blaming and responsabilization that happens that victim survivors encounter. So they're just expected to do this work and, and held to account if there is some kind of breach of safety as well. 
And that includes when they are contacting telecommunications agencies, platforms, justice, justice agencies. So I think when we're thinking about this huge burden of safety work, we can't really say that safely using technology or even continuing to use technology is really empowerment. Uh, so then what about maybe freedom from violence if we think about that as empowerment? And here I just want to flag a brilliant idea that um, a colleague of mine has um, pioneered and that's this idea of freedom work. And so it's that kind of labour that somebody will undertake to create conditions that enable them to be free from violence, to live their lives, to do what they want to do using tech, to, to use it to socialise, civic engagement, employment, um, education, whatever they want to do. And we can assume that those things are right and we might even use human rights frameworks. Um, we can think about it as something that should be expected and protected. But in reality, for people who are subjected to violence, that's a lot of work to try and secure those kind of rights to try and prevent that harm. And it really does fall onto them, this burden again. So those who've also been marginalised, who encounter exacerbated barriers, have a really, a really heavy burden in, in freedom work as well as safety work. And I think we really need to acknowledge structural inequalities here. And that means we need to think about things like colonialism and racism and homophobia and transphobia and patriarchy and ableism, all of those things. And we also need to recognise that we are asking people to do this work who have huge impacts on their well-being, their, their safety, their sense of security, and who are also likely still experiencing violence. There, there really is that myth about exiting violent relationships and, and harm just suddenly stopping. So I think this means that we need to think about empowerment as more than preventing individual harms, as more than safety work or safely using tech. And I really think it's more when this freedom work isn't necessary, when there are just freedoms to use technology, there are just uh, freedoms to, to do what you want without needing to protect and fight for those rights. And if we're acknowledging that there are these structural um, inequalities and issues, it means that we need to think about ways to challenge these ideologies, to challenge these hierarchies that support oppression and entrapment. Uh, and I can't speak uh, too much to this, but I'm just finishing off a project with the um, eSafety Commission on women with cognitive or intellectual disabilities who've experienced tech abuse. And what they've really highlighted is um, the ways that uh, accessibility and their needs and vulnerabilities are not taken into account by those who are developing technology or regulating technology. And I think that really does highlight these expectations that we just have about how technology works and how people can, um, can navigate their lives with, with the different experiences they might have. So we need to think more about these kind of broader structural um, inequalities. And it means that we need to think about things like diversity in the tech industry. It means we really need to be thinking about including voices of those who've been marginalised and victimised. And that means it has to be in all elements. It has to be in the development of technologies, in the management of technologies, in the regulation of technologies, as well as, of course, pursuing these broader social changes, the broader issues of, of power that we have in society. I think it also means that we need to think about uh, safety by design as a matter of course, as opposed to something that is often just not considered. Uh, I have some colleagues in the US who are pretty successful at essentially shaming Google into removing some uh, different spyware that was really harmful, especially for uh, victim survivors of domestic violence. And that's great, they were able to achieve that, but it really shouldn't have had to be a fight that needed to happen in the first place. So I think what it means is that we're not putting the onus on those who are most affected by negative features and effects of technology to protect their safety, to address harms or to secure their freedoms. And some of this might sound a bit uh, utopian or a negative or impossible, but I do think that it's something that we can absolutely pursue. And I also want to acknowledge that there are lots of ways that technology is harnessed by victim survivors, advocates and practitioners in ways that they find really empowering. And so I'm thinking about, for instance, uh, victim survivors who felt really powerless when they have disclosed violence and in responding to violence. 
and how they've used things like Twitter or different social media platforms to find voice and to, uh, to critique different narratives about violence, to critique victim blaming, uh, using things like hashtags or online campaigns. And of course, we could critique all of those elements. We could critique social media platforms and things like hashtags and how and if that really would affect change more broadly. And if there are certain victims who might be preferenced and certain victims who might be excluded and silenced. But we do need to acknowledge that for some people, technology has been harnessed and been seen as positive and empowering in that way. So just in closing, what I wanted to do was point to some things that I think I'm grappling with and certainly keen to discuss further. And that's as researchers, how we might think more about empowerment. And firstly, it might be in critiquing our disciplines. And of late, there's been a lot of debates about uh, my main discipline, criminology, and how it might be really complicit and facilitating and encouraging inequalities and, and pretty negative effects. So that is a useful thing that we might think about. We can also think about empowerment in methodology. So in design, in approach, in analysis, we might think about outputs. And I think the DMRC is so strong in looking at non-traditional outputs. So things like submissions or exhibitions or uh, engaging with industry and webinars or being on boards, those kind of, I guess, maybe game changes in different ways but universities don't recognise this very well in terms of metrics all the time. So it's a challenge that we have to uh, in doing our work. And the last thing I think we can talk about further in terms of empowerment is really supporting our um, researchers. And here I'm really thinking about people who are marginalised, excluded or working in trauma related spaces who are potentially encountering backlash in uh, the activist and alternative work that they're doing institutions are notoriously less visible in providing support here. And it's a broader comment about academia, not, not QUT in particular. But we need to maybe think about recognising the effects of research, the emotional labour and tax on those who are supporting colleagues and students who are aligning with their experience sure. and identities. Uh, so that's probably more questions and answers moving forward. But I do actually have a lot of optimistic thoughts about empowerment and yes, keen to, keen to hear what others think and to carry the discussion forward. Fantastic. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much uh, for that, Bridget. Um, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions at the end. So I'd next like to invite uh, Cecily Michaels uh, to speak with us and to share her screen and to share some insights into the on the ground work in this space uh, that she does uh, in Western Sydney and around Australia. Thanks, Cecily. Thanks, Amber. Um, and thank you, Michael and Amber and DMRC for this invitation. It's really um, a fabulous opportunity to inform uh, a bigger audience of people what are the challenges we deal with in the whole debate around empowerment of people through tech skills. Can You can see my screen, I hope. Um, I just want to say thank you to um, Bridget for that really moving account of the uh, tech facilitated abuse that we have in our community. And when I first went to a WESnet, um, the Women's Services Network, the peak body for this uh, conference, it just blew my mind of what women are also facing from another layer of tech, of, you know, digital inclusion. Um, but, um, and yeah, I look forward to hearing um, Christelle as well. So um, I want to start just with, um, just making you think for a second, when you, well, it's happened to me, I'm sure it's happened to you uh, at some time in your life where your internet gets disconnected and how disempowering that is. And, you know, that's the access part of technology and digital inclusion. But for us, we're dealing with the skills, which I think is the hardest part. I mean, the other two are sold by money and, and you know, corporations, but skills has to be you know, intrinsically motivated and you have to have a, someone who's providing it. So um, LEAP, which was originally called Tri-Community Exchange, has existed for nearly 30 years. And we were funded to provide tech support to the staff that worked in aged and disability care out in Western New South Wales and Western, um, um, in all of Western New South Wales, from Central West to Broken Hill, Burke. And it was, it was how we were known in the sector that we are a tech place and we used to then do, um, you know, specialist tech um, calendars of courses every, every semester and we were very popular. Um, but, uh, you know, with all the changes in the sector in the age and disability space, the 
organisations and staff have uh, just stopped wanting to invest in in increasing the skills of their of their um, you know um, staff members. So they um, that was dying out. And when I took over, um, I'm in my seventh year now. I I needed what to know where we were focusing ourselves because we had a mantra that we were too we do too many different things so we didn't know what you know we really did so I can't work that way and so I um, got some mentoring from an amazing uh, CEO of Wayside Chapel and uh, you know I thought about it until one morning I woke up and I thought that's it we are about digital inclusion the equal development equal rights to um, digital literacy for anyone who's disadvantaged so it meant change, you know, leading the board into that mission and getting approval for that. And then um, when our funding was finally extended, we knew we were going to exist for another two more years. Um, we did some business planning and we decided we needed a name that actually people could relate to us. I'm sorry about this history, but I just want to get you the context of why, where I'm, where we're coming from. So we we um, were a Queensland company rebranded us as Leap, which is the definitive step you take when you're ready to make a change in your life for something better. So uh, it's not an acronym. And because there is a little, there's another little company um, in a Durham Bandy or somewhere Liz registered as that, we had to keep the NGO, which is our domain. So um, we started doing, um, having a partnership with the Good Things Foundation when they were still only just in England. And we learned a lot that there was a lot of fear from organizations wanting to help their clients learn tech skills. Uh, we then um, were running, um, you know, tech out of our own office. We had a training room. So twice a week we had what we called the leap in lab and we we're getting data that way. We'd started by doing courses for people, found everyone was at a different level on a different device, impossible to teach. They were so, they were just going to fall behind if you didn't have one-on-one. -on -one. So we'd started doing one-on-one -on -one and then, um, you know, the Good Things Foundation model, which Helen Milner had coached me on, was, you know, that we, we get other organisations to run their own. But it was impossible. People just would not do it. They just want workshop after workshop. So, you know, I, I guess I gave up on empowering services to do it. And in some business planning, when, again, we got some funding extended again, um, it was suggested that we take on doing it an outreach. Now, that was a huge pivot for us. In fact, half the team, not half the team, I'm exaggerating, a few people had to leave because they just couldn't handle the agility of the, the, the randomness of not knowing how things were going to work out in the field. So we, you know, we targeted about 16 locations and we got them all up running, up and running. And we used then a Google Docs to book people in and Trello board so everyone knew. So they were open source so everyone could access what was going on. But we found that staff in these organisations didn't have the skills to use Google Docs and they were downloaded as an Excel spreadsheet. So nobody knew if there was someone booked in or not. And it, it created so many problems. So when COVID hit, we pivoted again. We reviewed our learners to find out what they, um, would, they would they do it remotely? And they 70% said they'd give it a go. But most of our tech mates dropped off because they were homeschooling. So we recruited all around Australia then for tech mates. And we had requests from all around Australia to support people who needed digital literacy. But did those result in anything? And I'll talk about that more at the end. Um, and so we then put our whole system into our database so that our tech mates have a login and they are matched to a learner in there. So the relationship is directly between the two of them. And that way, if a learner can't come or a tech mate can't come, they can tell each other. So, um, I better move. Oops. So now I just want to give you an overview of our whole model. So it's a for I believe it's affordable because it's volunteer driven. Without volunteers, we are nothing, and um, that can be an issue finding them in certain locations. Um, it is replicable replicable and scalable because you know it can be taken anywhere and and started at the only you know place I think I mean I think every place has to have um, its own you know we're always open to trying different um, variations of it like maybe do a, a, um, a like a, a group sort of introduction to something and then do the one-on-one -on -one. but really the one-on-one -on -one is the key to everything and we've not yet been <coughs> in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, like specifically, we tried, well, I've just been trying to negotiate that in the last couple of weeks, but it's the timeline for the tender was too 
short to really make it properly. So we, we've put that on hold, but that's another area I'd like to co-design. And the other part of it is I think you always need a local partner because you need that local um, introduction. People don't, people don't trust technology, so they're not going to trust an organisation just coming out anyway. So we want to nest ourselves into communities and invest in those communities, build their capacity so they run it. Um, it's evidence-based because we have tracked data from the very start. We, we do a new learner um, at, um, baseline data. So we find out what they're doing, how they're doing it, how often they're doing it, on what, and, you know, often it's nothing, often, you know, it's maybe, yeah. It's, so we know what they start with, we know what they learn for every session, and we know how they rate themselves. Now, that, that to me is not everything. We, I love more data on, on our impact, but at least we have, you know, we're tracking what we do. We also have safety and quality checks in place. So we, you know, there are points where, the, where team members contact learners to check on things. We can track. We have area coordinator roles that that manage, oversee the what's happening. Has a session been recorded? Uh, has a session been booked? Has it been recorded? And um, you know, so we we have ways of checking that everything is going um, safely. So as I said, um, the actual model down there, we link learners to the tech mates. We have, a, you know, obviously established systems, processes, and policies that we're constantly reviewing and revising, and we have impact evaluations that we conduct biannually. And I believe we're creating a movement of tech mates for Australia. We used to call them digital mentors, but uh, it was talking to, um, I was going to present at um, the N10 conference in Baltimore when COVID hit. And so I was um, co-presenting with the, a woman from Kansas City Library who does exactly what LEAP does in Kansas City. Like I've never met anyone with the same model where they recruit volunteers, have outreach programs, and they had experienced, um, they they used the words digital coach because digital mentor wasn't working. Because people, especially if they speak English as a second language, have not heard of that term and they don't know what it means. So we figured because we're Australians, we try tech mates. And so far it hasn't been a problem, but you know, these are all things we monitor. I forgot to get set my timer. I was gonna, anyway. Amber, give me five minutes warning, okay? So this is just some of, this is, since we started doing digital mentoring in 2015, we have done about 3,500 sessions after we did groups for five weeks. So since then, when we started doing one-on-one -on -one sessions and for the, we've only been doing them in remote, you know, outreach, we call, you know, not just at the LEAP office, which no longer exists because we all work um, fully remote now. Um, it was only the one location. So we've only been doing that since July, 2018. So I think that's not too bad, but I think it should be a lot more. We have a thousand plus learners and we have, our tech mates come and go, as I say, we lost a lot during COVID. Then we recruited, it was a highly popular role that we had a hundred within a month apply, but then matching them with learners who were willing to give it a go when it really was on the cards was not so easy. So we lost some then. And we'd have at least 25 locations, but some of them start and stop and then new ones start. So that's our overall impact so far or outreach. What topics they choose to do, it's really disturbing. And this is what I'm really glad that I'm able to tell you all about because our data shows that most commonly people come to us to learn how to email, to text on their phones, or even answer their phones. It's so basic what people come to us with, or photographs, or they've been given an iPad and they don't have any idea what an app is. Um, some learn WhatsApp, some learn how to use their address books or maps, but hardly anyone does government services online or online banking or shopping. It's just there is total resistance to those type of topics. And we have been now um, concerned about this for at least two years, if not more. Yeah, I'd say three years, I think. Um, and so when we got an opportunity to do a ComBank Design Jam at the end of um, 2000 and this is 21, 20, end of 2019, just before COVID hit, we, um, out of that, we decided, we, you know, we, we did some in-depth interviews and we um, analysed that and then we coded it and, and uh, you know, uh, 
matched them into categories and then voted on them and looked at parallel worlds. And we decided that we really needed to develop something that would guide learners in their learning journey or something that would motivate them to continue going on. But then COVID hit, we pivoted our model and we've just, um, we've just been going through another process with um, pro bono support from Atlassian. And we've got another idea on the burner, but um, it's just so hard to get funding because most funding bodies don't understand just how, how crit you know the the complexity of actually getting people to learn and and you know it concerns me that to become functionally digitally literate you actually need a whole range of skills that people aren't getting they're just coming in to solve a problem or learn one thing and then they leave so um when we talk to people we do a lot of promotion in shopping centers in communities at events whatever we just meet enormous hostility well i say hostility but it's like their fear of being scanned is huge so they just don't want to have anything to do with technology their lack of confidence that they might break something or that they're not intelligent enough or they couldn't possibly do it because that's how tech used to be perceived is so strong or they just have no motivation they're the people i don't care about as much because they're just impossible. My, I had a father who just had an absolute tantrum if I ever, like he had a laryngectomy. He's, my mum my had moved into the nursing home. If he wanted to talk to me, he could do it by opening the iPad and call me and I could read his lips, but he just would just explode with frustration if I asked him because he just didn't, he had no motivation whatsoever. He was intelligent enough, but he wasn't motivated. So, you know, these are the things we really want support to overcome. Now, this is a picture of, of um, Margaret. I met her at um, U3A, the University of the Third Age. Um, they wanted to do a sort of like a speed tech help thing and we had 20 minutes each and Margaret came just because she had no idea how to text. And that literally was her face when I showed her how to text. Now, to me, that is empowerment. But imagine how much more empowerment could people have if they really could control their lives using tech um, to do all the things that they need to stay safe be connected and have the independence that they deserve. So um, that's me, let's leap. Thanks so much, Cecily. I, I think, you know, some of what you've shared with us is just a real eye opener as to firstly, you know, how n deep the digital divide is in parts of our country and also what it takes to reach these people and, and to make a difference. And, um, you know, the, the work that LEAP's been doing and continually improving and, and you know, um, reaching more and more people through trialing different models and seeing what works um, is really inspiring. So thank you so much for that. So finally, we have Crystal. Uh, who is, as I said earlier, a PhD student in the DMRC and she's going to share her research with us. Thanks, Crystal. Hi, thanks Amber, thanks Michael also for the invitation to speak today and thank you so much for the previous presenters. I hope my a uh, short discussion of my research. Um, it links quite clearly with, with the discussion we just had, uh, both Bridget and Cicely's uh, presentations, and I hope we'll have a good discussion afterwards on this. So um, my, my presentation today uh, is just going to briefly provide a brief summary of uh, my research on what counts as digital empowerment in South Africa today, uh, based on my analysis of uh, policies, government rhetoric, rhetoric in the media, and then also prominent digital inclusion efforts. Um, and then also who at the moment stands to benefit from uh, these more prominent digital empowerment initiatives. And what my research found was that at present, um, these initiatives, also government policies are dominated still by, despite decades of African feminist research on uh, empowerment, uh, gender issues um, and development, it continues to be dominated by liberal feminist understandings of digital empowerment. Uh, and these approaches tend to center the business case for gender equality with an emphasis on skills and staffing needs for technology companies. So these uh, projects and programs teach and train specific skills that will allow people to do uh, very um, narrowly defined jobs, often micro work in companies 
that when something like COVID hits, tend to disappear overnight. And then at the same time, people who are best positioned to benefit from these initiatives continue to be the already privileged, to have some digital skills already in hand, to have access to computers regularly. And that is just not the case for the majority of South Africans. And what then happens is that these approaches tend to perpetuate coloniality. And at the end of the day, exacerbates inequality and in a country like South Africa, which has the greatest inequality in the world, that is a real concern. And women in this framing are understood as underused resources and not really seen as citizens and as, as people who have a very important contribution to make to democratization. And the needs, the digital inclusion and empowerment needs of uh, gender diverse people are completely ignored in the framing of these programs, policies and approaches. Um, and these approaches also tend to center the individual and not the communities. And they, in this way, they, they tend to not account for the impact of structural fact factors, something which Bridget also highlighted in her presentation. And what then ends up happening is that they reward the exploitation of power asymmetries. Um, so the companies who design projects that are sold as empowerment initiatives stand to gain cheap employment, but it doesn't really, at the end of the day, empower the people uh, to continue work or, or to actually um, have a sustainable um, uh, career path. And these wins, as we noticed with COVID, are incredibly easily uh, erased when there's a crisis. So this, the, those type of jobs just disappear overnight and people are left with where they were before. Um, so then in a country like South Africa, which, is, which has vast power symmetries and social economic inequalities along multiple axes, would require far more complex interventions. And I believe that African feminist theory and praxis that has been developed over decades uh, on development, gender empowerment, are today overlooked way too much. They have a very important contribution to, to make, especially since it views gender as a multi-dimensional structure that operates across multiple intersections and factors that shape digital inclusion and exclusion. So what a lot of the current interventions do is, is, is almost just to tick the box um, plan, like we trained X number of women coders and that's the end of your gender empowerment effort. It does not take into account the, the very, very complex gender relations in the country, especially the extremely high rates of gender-based violence that strongly influence um, digital gender inclusion. Um, and what my research found is that uh, community-based organization, organizations and activists act as a very important bridge between people who are already connected and the precariously connected by providing um, almost soft skills training and also taking away a lot of the fear and helping community members to use digital technologies to address their most pressing needs, which is an urgent need in the country. Um, so to set in place a more sustainable digital environment approach, what is needed is to create far more positive conditions for civil society actors to participate in decision-making processes and helping the, to develop a vision for technology in society. So for instance, before COVID hit, the uh, South African president, President Ramaphosa, was strongly influenced by the World Economic Forum's rhetoric on the fourth industrial revolution, um, claiming that the country is set to under, uh, to to change its development path by centering digital technologies. Um, but that diverted funding and research, research funding, especially away from pro poor research towards things like um, artificial intelligence, blockchain and so forth, which, which completely ignores the reality of the vast majority of people in the country. So what is needed is a shift in focus towards pro poor policies with an emphasis on, on interventions that can help to distribute wealth. Um, and also uh, interventions and, and, and empowerment initiatives that can support and further the very vibrant 
um, practice of digital epistemic disobedience I've observed among uh, activist groups, community-based organizations that challenge dominant uh, Eurocentric narratives and knowledge, as well as design online, which is a very, very creative and important contribution they can make. Um, and there's a much greater need for formal participatory and action-oriented bottom-up approaches based on the lived realities of the communities that um, that a lot of the other projects claim to empower but don't really get to do. And that is me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. And, and thanks for uh, shifting the conversation a little bit in terms of giving insight into some of the more, I guess, macro systemic issues that surround digital inclusion you know it's not just about being connected for being connected sake it's about you know societal um, shifts in um, social and economic circumstances across class and and all of those things so it was really great to hear those um, those perspectives from you so we actually have more than, than 30 minutes now. Uh, we finished a little bit early uh, for the audience to uh, ask any questions that you might have. If you'd like to ask a question in person, just put your video on and, and ask it. Otherwise you can um, post a question in the chat. While you're thinking of your question, I might just um, start off with one. Uh, Bridget, I've got a question for, for, for you. So we know that digital literacy and digital inclusion is, is lower uh, in rural and remote areas, yet you talked about some really quite sophisticated methods um, that abusers use um, um, when, you, when, when abusers use technology um, to inflict harm. So I just wondered if you could make a comment about um, I guess that 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 um, contrast between how we kind of understand rural and remote digital participation and, and how sometimes um, it's actually played out uh, in the real world. Yeah, I guess I feel that we there is still such a gap when we think about digital inclusion in rural areas. And that has so many implications in relation to domestic uh, violence victim survivors. It does mean that you have less access to informal support. So your friends, your family, you have less opportunity to contact um, formal support. So thinking about, for instance, a medical assistant, thinking about police. Uh, and less opportunity for things like education and employment, uh, which is so key, especially if someone's limiting your finances, um, you don't have those options necessarily in your area. Uh, and then there are of course other implications, like if you can't access a service and um, abusers will also, particularly for legal services, they'll intentionally sometimes cause conflicts of interest. So accessing all of the legal services on the ground. And so you have no choice but to go outside of your area. Um, so, it is just so important for, um, I guess, that health and wellbeing and options to exit relationships. And um, the risk is so much higher in rural, regional, remote places. And I do find it very frustrating that um, these are not new barriers. They're things that we've had, we've been dealing with for a very long time and I still don't feel we've progressed. But what has progressed is the ways that advocates and practitioners are using tech to engage with victim survivors. And so that's doing things like say remote safety checks can be really useful or helping you connect with agencies in other areas. Um, but I think we have so far to come still. And I, I don't have the answer, but I think that we need to really, really prioritize digital inclusion uh, in rural regional remote more broadly, and then think about different cohorts and vulnerabilities in that context. On mute. Ah, oh, start again. 
Uh, the first imperative of tech platforms is to monetize. For many startups, the aim is to become a so-called unicorn company making billions of dollars. The goal is rarely to become socially responsible or to do social good. This seems to be driven by masculinist fantasies of success and would seem to be in direct opposition to empowering women and children, especially those experiencing family and domestic violence. So Bridget, I know this is a massive problem, but do you have thoughts about how startups and established companies can be more inclusive and do better? Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, definitely we need to be thinking about sort of startups as well, but there's also, and I won't name them because I don't want to give it any uh, airtime, but there's a big company that's just come out with something that um, it, it just, it really terrifies me. It's going to, um, I don't know how, it's going to be combated, but it's going to really change the way that abusers are able to track moving forward. So I think the problem is very much with big companies too. With them, we can put maybe more emphasis on the PR and the, and the kind of advertising dollars and such. And that's what has happened with Google. I mentioned Google and Spyware before. It was a very bad sort of PR situation and we got them to respond. Um, I think what really does need to happen overall is uh, more diversity. So, and we need to be thinking about that in many levels. So we need to be thinking about that in terms of um, sort of development in education opportunities. So in universities, um, in our companies, but to me, diversity is just really key because I think there are so many um, people's views who are overlooked when are creating tech who do not think about the ways that it can be misused and the victimization and the regulation. So that is just really, really key we could maybe think about some different regulations. Um, I feel it's so it's so frustrating that we have to ask people to think about to think about others. Um, but maybe, yeah. So maybe I guess more diversity is what I feel most passionate about. And embedded in the process from the beginning, um, which links back into Cecily's co-design methodologies, uh, and also back into what Crystal Crystal was saying with her research as well. We have another question here from Guy Healy, who thanks the speakers for their eye-opening presentations. The question is, is that there, there is a strong trend among female high-profile social media entertainers, many with hundreds of millions of views, to emphasise girls' empowerment. While it's a broad activity, I was wondering if the panel has a has a very on the usefulness or has a view on the usefulness of this activity or whether their efforts are better directed in other ways. Does anyone want to jump in on that one? Oops, Crystal okay. speaking too. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, look, I think social media entertainers the the fact that they put an emphasis on that is a it's a great thing uh any any effort helps but what would help much more is if they actually give their platform to people who are doing the work uh and allowing those people to speak for themselves to 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 have a space to highlight their lived realities the day-to-day -day issues they face in terms of access and and what is actually needed because um, a lot of people who are doing most of the digital inclusion work in developing countries have zero funding. Um, and most of the people of, of my, the participants in, in my project did at least three jobs. So, yeah, I think it, it would be helpful if they give more space to those voices directly. Thanks, Crystal. Um, Bridget or Cecily, would you like to add anything? to that question? No, it's not in my area of expertise, but, um, you know, these are the much more complex layers that um, are over, you know, our passion is just to get people to have the skills to be able to use social media, <laughs> you know. Um, one of our new board members is doing her PhD research, um, teaching seniors how to use Instagram. And she says that they like that more because it's, uh, it's not as, invasive as um facebook and it hasn't got all that you know text that goes with it it's just the picture and they and their grandchildren are using it so that's their way of staying in contact but it's got nothing to do with your question guys so i'll sorry 
I think it I think it does address the question Cecily because we can't assume necessarily that like you said that that the digital skills are there for people to to interact with these types of um, I guess messages on social media. So we, in in many instances, we need to go right back to basics and give them the the access and the skills to be able to even participate in these kinds of conversations online. Naomi Barnes has a question, and I'd actually like to invite her to come on video and ask it herself, if she's able. There she is. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you very much. It was a really good presentation. Um, I'm really interested in any or um, in anything, and uh, there were sort of hints of it. But has anyone come across how people teach each other to be digitally included and empower each other? Sort of like we talk a lot about the digital tech skills that people need and how we can give them to them, or how we can change tech companies. But I often wonder how, like a lot of the stuff that happens online, is communities working it out themselves and changing, and changing the way tech works from the inside, rather than, and then tech responds to how those communities do. So how those grassroots sort of people do those types of things. So one of the things I'm thinking more of is how kids teach their parents how to use um, technology and those sorts of things. But um, I was wondering if there's any sort of case studies or examples you've got of anecdotes you've got of when that's happened in your fields. Thanks. Um, I have a few examples. Cool. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Yep. Go ahead, you, Crystal. All right. Um, so one example that I had in my uh, in my research was um, trans activists who um, because a lot of their content was being blocked in social media spaces, um, what one of the participants mentioned was the importance of focusing on the boring tech stuff. Uh, and because a lot of the members of their community have very little access to digital tools and technologies, they use things that are more accessible like Google Docs to create um, and to teach people how to use that to access resources like doctors, uh, information, because uh, what they realized was that a lot of the big organizations have uh, very fancy websites that are often sponsored by donors from overseas, but most of the community members don't have enough, enough data to really access that regularly. So they had to go with a lower tech version and, and actually share information on things like USB sticks um, and to build archives and databases um, that are very low tech. And, and that is one of the things like that is often overlooked interventions once shiny apps and, and things like that, but actually teaching community members how to use the, the more like the, the participant mentioned the boring tech stuff and how valuable that can be. Yeah. Amber, can I just add something? Um, I feel like I know something, but I can't remember. I, my memory is not great these days, but I do know that when I talk to Susan, um, Oh, I can't think of a surname, but she's the manager or general, you know, the head of Uber. She said that their model for um, getting clients onto the Uber app is um, their children will teach them. So, um, you know, given how many years and I'd say four or five years that we've been talking to governments and um, corporations, banks, everyone says, oh, it's a no brainer. They, they would love to fund digital literacy. But no, there is no... There is no, um, you know, vision. Like even um, New South Wales government, you know, our, you know, it's been written in Innovate Oz that, you know, we're the most digitally state, you know, in, I don't know, somewhere. And when I talked to them about the need for digital literacy, they said, uh, oh, they're only worried about getting 70% online and they won't be worried about the other 30% for, you know, um, five to 10 years, which could take that long for people to learn. It's like learning to drive. You have to build your skills until you've got a, comp a range of competencies that you can put together. And, uh, but I think, I don't know whether everyone's thinking that, that children will teach or someone will teach, but like my neighbors, you know, when COVID hit, 
their children are all living interstate or in the country in remote communities and no one was here to teach them how to use whatsapp so i discovered they hadn't even set up their google play and i you know and that it wasn't you know it went and meant a few lessons just to learn whatsapp and then the same with the service new south wales app which we um our government our government the state government um gave, has given four vouchers that have to be used by june which you can only get through the app and uh, you have to use the app to log in everywhere for COVID. And uh, she was taking photographs of everything. She was showing me that she'd done it. And I go, no, no, no. And so I, I taught her again. And then she texted me and told me how, how she'd done it. She was so grateful. But will they learn anything more from me? And I've been lived next to them for 13 years and we're very close. You know, I take their bins out for them, everything. But they don't trust me even to teach them how to do more online, except for what they need, solve a problem. You know, and I actually think when when uh, when there's no cash economy, you know, I, although I do understand that there probably will always have to be that as a legacy because if every all technology fails, someone will need cash. But uh, but that will be an impetus to get everyone having to get online. And then what's going to happen if if no services are there funded to exist? We, you know, we've only got funding assurity for one more year, so. <laughs> You know, I just it, it concerns me that there is not enough thinking, although in um, Infrastructure Australia has been looking at the digital divide, um, which is really good. They've taken that really seriously, but I, I'm, I haven't unpacked the actual priorities that they've recommended for dealing with digital literacy. The ones I could see were all around particular communities like rural and remote Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, not the whole population and even though we have no stats on how many people don't have digital literacy really we only know how many people don't have the internet but i think if we really if we really knew how many people they have the internet like my mum you could have said she was on the internet because i taught her how to use facebook but she was so confused all the time and you know often just couldn't use it because she didn't realize she'd swiped into something and couldn't get out of it that's not digital literacy that's not functional you know so i i and then all the people i meet that you know majority 90 99 percent when i'm out promoting don't want to touch technology so i think there's millions of people i'd say i would guess five million in australia at least that haven't got digital literacy and i have no right to say that because i don't have the evidence but that's my sense from these I think some of the um, most exciting work is being done by NGOs at the moment. Um, there's a lot of really great things. Um, and all I really love is take back the tech um, because they support and promote a lot of initiatives. They're doing a lot with WowNet in Uganda, who are super great. Um, they also do a lot of different um, activist kind of things and they will have different campaigns. And you know they, they do just a lot around awareness, but actual kind of um, funding and supporting some different trials and in like really, really around the world inclusive. Um, I guess the other point I think is that there's some really great ways that we should be letting communities lead the way. Um, some of the women I've worked with, the cognitive uh, intellectual impairments, like they would, while we were having these focus groups, they would be like, well, this is what you need to, oh, is that happening to you? This is what I did on my phone. And we talked about it and they said, what they'd really like is to incorporate those kind of tech information things where they are really leading the game in some of the support networks that they have. They've got those trust and bond with other people in the group. And what I think is so important about that is they know what happens in practice is quite different in what happens in theory. Like, yes, you might do this, this, this to respond to something on Facebook, but in practice, what are the challenges with the accessibility or what doesn't work there or how might Facebook not be really great at moderating that? Um, so I do think really asking communities um, and helping them develop, supporting them develop instead of going in and saying, this is what you need, but this is how, um, this is what you want and how can we support you to do that can be really great. Thank you. Crystal, Michael's asking for a bit more detail about what's working in South Africa and your, the co-design approaches there. Okay, thanks Michael for the question. Um, just first, before I answer the question, I can also vouch for Take Back the Tech and, and pretty much everything that APC does um, in building community. So that is one example of sort of co-designing with communities to improve uh, digital inclusion and to fight things like um, harassment and so on online. 
Uh, but one example that I worked with uh, or that I spent time with is the Good Work Foundation. Um, it's in rural Pumalanga and they do absolutely incredible work um, with the community there. And they started out um, that they wanted to just teach digital skills to the community. Um, but it's become so much more than that. What they realized was that uh, most of the participants um, don't know what they want to do in, in the world and, and have faced in, uh, multiple layers of trauma through their lives. And so they took a step back and focused on that and building strength in the community. And it's, it's such an incredibly support, supportive space. You just walk in there and everyone's singing and happy. Um, and, and so they really uh, shifted away from the focus on the digital itself and focus on the needs of, of, of the participants and then develop the skills training around, around those things. For instance, uh, building people's English literacy skills, because it's so difficult to build your digital skills without the... the and so there are group reading sessions. Um, and also, uh, because the community is, is situated right next to conservation areas, um, they started training people to... to um, to, to get jobs in that area too. So it's, it's really develops organically around that. And that is, in my opinion, the way to go with these kind of initiatives. Yeah. It's fascinating, Crystal. And it's, it's similar to the types of things that we've seen in our work on digital skills um, building and that it, it just needs to be contextualized that what you're learning has to mean something to you. Otherwise, learning, learning tech for learning sake is just, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. Kim, can I invite you to ask your question to Cicely? Yes, you can. I'm here. Uh, I'll get my sticker off. Uh, morning. Hi, Cicely. How are you going? Good. I loved that photo of Margaret. Um, thank you so much. That was like that joy in her face was absolutely wonderful. Um, I was just wondering if you can speak a little bit more about the outreach, the outreach activities that work for LEAP, obviously you've got quite a local area that you work in, um, and really how you get through to those people who are, you know, potentially relying on their kids or, you know, I'm thinking in my case of my parents, I have um, one parent who does the majority of the digital labour in the family, you know, and, and once, you know, one of them pass away, you know, what's going to happen? Um, to my father who's you know elderly and won't be using it so how how do you kind of reach these people that are just relying on their you know local community networks at the moment um and you know which type of activities work the best i want to thank you for putting that in the chat so i had time to think about it because you know <laughs> the brain does not think on the spot but i had thought of quite Absolutely. a few things i'd love to share if you're all Excellent. in um so when we first went to outreach it was partly motivation that we had a contract where you you only get, you only can report on the hours that you deliver to the government. And the hours that we had to reach were 2,476. So I um, targeted retirement villages. And what I found is you have to go through the residence committees. The actual owners of retirement villages, all of them didn't want to have a bar of it, anything to do with tech. And I think all retirement villages should have free Wi-Fi for all their residents and, you know, and, and you know provide the the skills to use it like i can't believe that they don't see that but anyway re, the um residence committees all could see it so that was a that was like i was started obviously the easy one was my parents where they were in bucklands and springwood and um so we talked to the 80 plus that came to the residence committee meeting and plus they have a newsletter that goes out to all the other hundreds of residents and yeah we we recruited um, learners very easily there and we started doing it on a Saturday because I wanted I wanted to volunteer myself because I wanted to see what was happening. I didn't want to ask someone else to do a job that I didn't know how it worked. And and uh, it, yeah, it was it that was an e they were easy ones. All the retirement villages we targeted, easy. Um, another successful one was where we recruited in Blacktown area a lot of tech mates that would I mean it's their characters. One was a highly organised woman. And 
you know, I don't know, they're just the team of them. They were all local. They all worked well together. And that location was always popular with learners. It was probably the partnership with the provider as well. But because the venue wasn't a regular available so it was like one week it was here but not for two weeks and then another week. and the old people can't work that way so this particular volunteer organized a separate venue where we could have it every week so there was continuity and of course then COVID hit um, when uh, before COVID when it was seniors week we would uh, smash the area where in Western Sydney where we were uh, located. And one of the things we did was work with St Mary's RSL. And so they advertised for a month before Seniors Week that we'd be there on these two days that week during Seniors Week. And someone there who, like your parents, um, Kim, it's the other way around. The husband did everything and the woman didn't. And she was like, just turned 70, being given an iPad. She has a son, but he's not patient and he's dying. Her husband was dying. And uh, she heard this there when they go there for their monthly um, trivia and thought, you know, I should really give this a go. And so she kept coming after the event there. She came to our office and I interviewed her once about her experience. And she was just so positive and said how, um, you know, our tech mate was really patient and much more patient than her son. And she'd gone to courses, but she couldn't follow it. And she thought she couldn't do anything. And she said, and my husband thinks I'm very clever. But, you know, having that set location too in our office meant we always had a strong trickle there. So I think it is partnerships. And I think it is the caliber of volunteers that we find in communities that bring people in too. But I want to talk about a couple of other um, models that have, I know about overseas. So um, we had a visit from Patricia Donald from Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, she was on a Churchill Fellowship. She went to Queensland as well. And uh, their model, they had funding um, to run and develop a, a program of subjects, but they, they found the community for that through the housing providers and they'd have a like a connector staff member who brought a group of like 10 to 12 people together that met every week for so many weeks and they ended this little program of learning different things um, with how to cl um, complain online <laughs> and apparently that was so popular like she just talked about that all the time and but they also came together and formed a community of people always together so it wasn't just learning the tech it was like you know, I guess talking about your lives and your children. And I have I have tried to get some funding to set something up like that twice, but it hasn't been successful. And I know uh, Michael and Amber told me that, um, you know, when they've done work in Queensland and Toowoomba and stuff, that it's work when you go through an existing group. But I, you know, I, I think like you um, said before, you know, it's it can't just be tech. And so people that are there for their reason, they don't want to learn tech. They're not going to learn it you know, in, in that group context. And the other one um, model I want to share with you is in San Antonio. So uh, this is San Antonio Housing Authority in America. And this woman um, who's spoken on one of our, um, uh, that um, from ADIA organized it. Um, so that's how I got in contact with her. She um, was funded to work in this organization um, by Google Fiber, by Google. And she, she set up a program that wasn't, she had no funding. She sourced everything, the funding to do everything from other corporations. But what they did was um, in, to encourage residents in the housing, of, um, yes, residents of the housing authority um, to learn about digital inclusion. They set up a passport and they had, you know, like seven subjects that were compulsory and a couple that are optional. And they would go to the libraries or all different providers to do those subjects. So they'd, it, and again, it was more course orientated, but then she had um, through another partnership organized for refurbished laptops and got someone to pay, like they got them donated through this refurbisher, like Work Ventures in Australia. And someone else would fund the cost of that refurbished um, laptop. And if they passed it, um, they would um, get, um, a lap, if they did the, all the courses and got their passport stamped, they would get a laptop. And she had a thousand people graduate that way. And I also would love to test that one, but I have all my negotiations hasn't worked on that one yet. Um, answer your question, Kim. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you, Cecily. That's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, and especially I think Michael's put it in there as well about Wi-Fi being available. Oh yeah, you know, care, care homes and. 
Yeah, so what we've done when we haven't got Wi Fi is we buy um, those pocket Wi Fi's, and sometimes we need two because we've got so many people. They, even though they say they can <laughs> support 10 people, it's not true. And the other thing about those pocket Wi Fi's is they're not made to last more than a year or something. They're ridiculous. You know, I've given up on Telstra and I've used Vodafone, it's much cheaper and cheaper to get the data. And I think there is a lot of myths out there about how expensive data is, and people don't know that they can get cheaper versions. And I, I think that's a whole education piece in itself. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll be, be looking into that in the linkage too. That'll be good. Excellent. Thanks so much, Cecily. Thanks for the question, Kim, and response, Cecily. And I think it's a really important point to bring up the affordability uh, piece in all of this, which is one of the key pillars of, of digital inclusion. It's one thing to have the access, it's another to be able to, to keep affording it in an ongoing way. Uh, I'm actually going to ask uh, Robert Rattle's question on his behalf because he is not in a position to jump on video at the moment. So this is for you, Bridget. It's, it's about this question of designing um, technology for empowerment of, um, I guess, the disadvantaged in, in, in that relationship, particularly in terms of um, privacy and location and, and is there anything coming in the, in the design of these technologies where where users can actually lock down their own um, profiles in ways that empower them to have more I guess autonomy um, and safety oh yeah I think it's a great question um, I guess one thing I would say is that um, the second, and I'm not on Snapchat, so I might get this wrong, but the second that Snapchat came out with, there was a change around location uh, sharing, and I think it was automatically activated. And the second that that happened, I thought, oh, well, that's a nightmare, and that's that's going to be a big safety risk. And, you know, talking to survivor colleagues, uh, survivor friends and um, advocates, that's that was exactly their reaction. Um, we often know what the problem is going to be. And so I think it's very useful just to have those conversations. Uh, one thing that is progressing pretty well in Australia is that we do have a number of different agencies who will go along to big domestic violence events and we will talk about the sort of problems that there are with different platforms and things to be uh, addressed. But a basic change, so I think that would be really important uh, and it could be part of uh, sort of co-design. So just having those conversations before something comes out, when something's being considered. Um, but there are also some more basic changes, like just having things that are opt-in and so they won't automatically happen and alerts when something is changing with an app uh, or a device or um, some kind of warning if that is, is, is changed would be really useful. So there's some quite basic tech things and also I think basic conversations that can be had um, there are a number of people, there's somebody uh, pretty senior in the uh, tech DB space in US who is now based at Facebook. Uh, so I'm kind of optimistic that there might be some changes there. And I think that would that's really useful around co-design, having people who are, she's very tech savvy, she also understands DB. Uh, so having people like that in uh, development and regulation kind of spaces is really, really, really useful. Um, I guess one of the challenges is that um, we also don't want to educate perpetrators. And so like, I'm trying to be very careful with, and I'm not going to mention the scary device that I talked about, but information sharing about some of the problems is really key, but it's hard to be, to know who you can flag some of the risks or ways that technology can be manipulated with. So some of these conversations maybe do need to be more closed and with tech industries and how do you get everyone in the room, especially if you're talking about startups? So there are certainly challenges there. There are more conversations happening. There are more people with experience around victimisation is in agencies, but some, some basic design changes around having things that are much more opt-in or alerts when things are changed would be incredibly useful. Thanks, Bridget. And if I could just, I guess, extend this question to rather than emphasizing you know what what um what individuals who are who are being abused can do to empower themselves are there interventions that are actually educating abusers about uh technology mediated um violence i guess in a similar vein to rather than educate women to dress differently we actually educate men to uh, think think and act differently um of course it's not binary like that but I guess along that kind of vein. 
Uh, I think there are more support networks and certainly advocates are using, especially with COVID, it was, I guess, one of the benefits to having lockdown is thinking about other ways to provide support. Huge challenges though with things like what telehealth looks like, um, but there have been probably more progress in the response than the prevention space. That's certainly somewhere we can go further. Um, on the negative side, there are unfortunately a lot of ways that perpetrators share tactics. So there used to be a bigger split between kind of low tech strategies and high tech strategies, and I don't think that really exists anymore. Um, so there's more that we can be doing, but we don't spend very much money on prevention. So that really needs to be much more of an investment um, and certainly something the government should be looking at further. Thanks very much. Are there any final uh, questions, comments, ideas, provocations? It's been a really uh, wonderful um, conversation at the end. We've covered a lot of terrain and I think the three speakers all brought something um, really valuable to the conversation, but there was also a wonderful through line in what you were all talking about. So um, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to prepare and to present um, for us today and congratulations on the work that you're doing and, uh, and the work that you will do, all three of you. Uh, thank you everybody for attending and unless Michael's got any final comments, I can go on mute. You're happy? Okay, Michael's happy. Everybody seems to be happy. So but thank you once again and uh, we'll be doing this in about another three months for a keyword forum three. If you have any ideas for a keyword that you'd like us to focus on, please just um, email uh, Michael or I and um, we'll take it on board. Thank you so much everybody and have a great day.